Everybody, everybody, man, I'm so excited to be back at you on Strong Inspirations. I, I got my glasses on. I don't even need them to tell you what I'm about to tell you, my friends. You are with Anthony Brogdon, and this is where you find Black history. That's what this channel does. It's my way of keeping this history alive. And, uh, you know, let me tell you something. What I do is I find these people. And they good looking people, man. I got a good looking brother on the channel, man. He tight. He got a necklace on his chest that let you know he wearing that 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 shirt to let you know he's serious about his his. This what he do. I'm so excited. He on the channel. Let me tell you something, my friend. I did. I found them somehow, and I called down there three, four times and. They was checking me out, wondering who I am and all that. Who this guy telling he want to put us on the channel. We want to make sure it's right. And, and, and then I guess they looked at a couple of videos and said, hey, it's right. And you, my friends, you know it's right because you've been watching me. And so he called, they, they called me one day, said, hey, uh, we want to do it. I said, oh, my God, I'm so excited that they want to do it. They coming out of uh, South Carolina. They huge. They huge down there, people. You're going to be impressed with what this man going to tell you. Watch. This is what I do on the channel. I find the people and let them, I ask a couple questions and I let them do the talking because I know they know what they're talking about. This is what they do for a living. They want to share this history with you. And this is all that I want to do is find a way to help them share. And that's what I'm doing today. So, you know, what, really what I'd like for you to do, my brothers and my sisters, is I want you to hit the subscribe button. Man, over the last two weeks, I had over 100 subscribers. This thing is going strong. Watch. It's hitting. Hit that button and it's free. You don't, you don't give no information. All you do is say, I subscribe. And then hit the like button on this video because you're gonna, I'm telling you, you're gonna like what my man come tell you. <laughs> man, I talked to him on the telephone. I said, man, I can't take no more. Wait till we come on the channel. He said, all right, I'll do that. Hit the uh, notifications bell because then I I'm putting up three, four videos a week. I don't miss it. And I can't tell you when I'm putting it in. Sometimes I tweet it out. And oh, check it out. I'm on Twitter at a strong dream. Sometimes I tweet it out and I let you know it's coming in a certain day. And sometimes I just get a vibe that I'm ready to let it go right then. I wake up in the middle of the night and say, I'm ready to let that go. And you got it. And then tell somebody about strong inspirations. Don't keep it to yourself. And, and you know what's happening? I'm a man waiting. He waiting patiently. I'm like, hold on one more second, my brother. So what's happening is I can feel something. Because I talked to a guy yesterday. He's a professor at a university in Arkansas, Little Rock, Arkansas. He said, man, these white folks is messing with me because I'm doing too much good. He said, they messing with me. I said, man, I, he on my channel because he wrote a book about his great, great, great uh, uncle, who was a, a lieutenant governor in the 1800s. Y'all should watch that. His name is Dr. Brian Mitchell. He said, they messing with me, man. And then he gonna come back on the channel. He gonna tell somebody about the Elaine massacre that happened in Arkansas. I hadn't even heard of that. That's, it, it was like just as bad as Tulsa. There's not as many people. I mean, death is death. One more thing. Uh, I check this out. I've been doing some thinking, my friends. And you know what I'm going to do? I got all these good people coming on my channel. So next year, 2020, I'm, I'm going to two of the cities. And I'm inviting you to join me. So the first one, I don't have my date just yet. But look out, stay in tune. We're going to Quindaro, Kansas. Quindaro, Kansas, them slaves walked across the water when it froze. And it, from Missouri, it ended up in Quindaro. We're going to the town where it ended up. I want 500, 1,000 of y'all to show up. We're going to have a party on Friday night in a barn. 
we going we going eat we going to drink some lemonade some iced tea and have some of that moonshine and then on Saturday we going to have a tour of the town and show you where them them slaves went from Missouri to Kansas and then we going to have a picnic we're going to roast some pigs and all that other stuff <laughs> I don't eat pig but nonetheless and, 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 and it's coming up. We're going to put the date on. I want you to be there. And, and the fundraiser is not for me. I do this because I want to. The fundraiser is for the museum in Queen Daryl. Stay tuned on that. And we got another city that we're going to announce soon. I'm in negotiation with them. Uh, I use the word strong a lot. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that's my introduction to the strong brother coming on now, man. Come on, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's get it on. Oh, no, peace, hold peace. on, hold on. I'm sorry, my friend. I'm sorry, my brother. One more thing. I'm yeah. going to go fast on this. Y'all know I'm so serious about this Black history. I did a movie about it. It's called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. It's a documentary, 75 minutes long. Slaves who went to college, slaves who bought their freedom. I name names in this movie. You want to watch that. It's streaming on Amazon. And I wrote a book about it. The book is called Black Business Book. It's got over 200 facts, unbelievable stuff. Same as the movie, but it's thorough. It's comprehensive. And for every 10th book I sell, I donate one to school. I got a probably about... Oh, about 80, 90 books I'm donating to schools when schools start back up. This is hitting. Get you a copy of this and go to my website, businessintheblack.net. Now I'm ready for my man. And he ready. He said, man, I've been, I got to get it off my chest. Come on, Word. brother. Introduce yourself. Let's get it on. Well, peace to you and everyone else. My name is Darren Lee Calhoun II. Um, I am the uh, Facilities Public Programming and Outreach Director over here at the Avery Research Center for African American History and Culture in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, we are part of the College of Charleston system. However, uh, when we start getting into a little bit of the history of the Avery, I can tell you a little bit more about how we actually got to this space. Um, about myself, I am also uh, a proud father of a uh, not 10 month old, not today, as well as, um, as, well as I'm a, a uh, elected official on the District 10 constituent board down here in Charleston. I'm an activist. I'm an organizer. I do so many things within this uh, city, as well as I'm on the director of the Race and Social Justice Initiative at the College of Charleston. Really? Yeah, that's a beautiful story. So, I mean, but, but is, is, uh, are you, uh, was your, did you grow up with an activism type, you know, your parents or something? How you get to be who you are, my man? Uh, it was I, was, I was born with it, you know. Um, black history, uh, when I got to Morehouse, I majored in African American studies. Um, black history has always been foundational within my life, learning about my family history, learning about um, from my uh, maternal and my paternal side and how we got to Detroit and how most of us got to Detroit from my, my maternal side from Alabama and from my uh, father's side via South Carolina, how we got up to Detroit. So it's always been a part of me. Um, even at CAS, you know, um, being part of BAM and um, doing, going up to Ann Arbor, protests up that way. Uh, but I really got into activism, uh, into my true activism and organizing at Morehouse. And then once I got to Charleston. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's there. My father was uh, at the time uh, when I was still in Detroit, he was the uh, director of the EEOC. And um, well, he was he worked for the EEOC inside of uh, Detroit, but now he's the director of EEOC inside of Richmond. So I always grew up knowing uh, that we always had to try to get justice by any means necessary. Okay, let me ask you this, man. This is the first question to pop up, man. It's a little bit about yourself. Right. When you say activism, do mm -hmm. the people appreciate your active that you're trying to activize for? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so. What's your take on that? When we fight, the, when we fight for the people, you have you can't be trying to do it for trying to get the uh, the praise of everybody. You know, you fight because you know what's right. Um, but uh, also, uh, throughout my years of being an activist and an organizer, I've always learned that you can be an activist, but in order to be uh, to, in order to make true effective change, you have to be a great organizer. Activism and organizing don't go hand in hand. 
you know, you have to be organized and you have to be intentional and you have to be methodical about the things that you're doing in order for your activism to take root and to grow within a community. Um, in Charleston, every, a lot of people know each other down here um, and everybody has their own fight. Um, and what we try to push down here is like, you stay in your lane. Like I fight for education. That's why I'm on school board now. You know, um, I fight for, uh, for different rights and you know, the justice within our community. And, you know, people appreciate what we do. Um, not, and everybody has a different way of their activism, you know? Um, not everybody gonna be out on the streets. Some people gotta do it in a different way, you know? So we, um, I, 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 people do appreciate it because they can see the change that comes from it. And then also you just gotta, uh, I, I'm big at making people mad, so oh, well, that makes you a yeah, great that, activist that, and a great organizer. Okay. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I what I what I was driving at. Do you do you mind the, the the darts that people throw at you for who do you think you are trying to do this? I'm not. I'm talking about the white people and the black people. What? Oh, how does absolutely. that make you feel? I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> I can give you an instance. Um, we had Tanahasi Coast come down in 2017 for the Race and Social Justice Initiative. And there were some forces that tried to shut down the program. Um, this was right after um, Reed Newsom climbed the state house and uh, climbed the state house in South Carolina to take down the Confederate flag, and they didn't want to bring Tanahasi Coast out here to talk about race in America. So um, as they tried to shut down the program, they tried to pull funding and everything. I paid for the whole thing and said, "All right, let's. Uh, I'm going to toss up a billboard now. So if y'all want to shut it down, I'll make it even bigger." So instead of the thousand people we thought we were going to have, we end up having three thousand people inside the TD Arena just because they they they, they mess with us. I got so, you. Uh, <laughs> I got you. Know, you. I'm big. At, I, I I enjoy knowing that people are irritated of the, uh, with the work that we have going on because that just shows that they don't want to take uh, they don't want the status quo to be eradicated, and that's what I we're here to take down. We take down that uh, that status quo um, because it's, it's, it hasn't gotten us anywhere to this day. And our people are still suffering and are pressed down here. So we, um, the only way to change the system is to tear it down and start uh, start all over. I love and that's it. what we're here for. Okay, how about this then? This this is a deep question, maybe. Uh, if you were like back in slavery days, or let's say the early 1900s, how, can could you have put your life on the line? You know what I'm saying? Could you had uh, uh, marched? Even knowing the KKK was coming around the corner, how, how, you know what I'm saying? How, how would you yourself dealt with them kind of obstacles to know that, man, this thing might not go really well today? When I get asked that question, it's hard to you know pull yourself into a time that you weren't in. But all I would say is we do it now. <laughs> KKK still around. They just wearing badges and uh, and uniforms, or you know they wearing robes and they're not on the judges, and they running the uh, they running different organizations or whatnot. Um, so they may not be doing it the same way. They may not be be so overt, but we still out there fighting right now. You know, um, so I'm hesitant to say yes because our ancestors they went through so much. Um, yeah. On an over and a um, on on an overt level as well as uh, uh, out of the plain sight, but you know, I'm I'm willing to say, you know, I would love to say yes, but you never know what you go into uh, going yeah. through. Uh, you never know what you would do unless you're in that time. We I would say sure. the same thing when we uh, organized in 2015. Yeah, I, mean, I was in, in my in my view, I was like, all right, I'm not out here trying to get arrested or anything. But then also, I was like, I don't really care <laughs> you know, what they're gonna, oh, really? they really gonna do with us. You know, um, you know, when yeah. we have, people following us and everything. Uh, when we really start getting into it and disturbing that status quo, you start seeing and hearing the voices of people and the threats that were coming out against you, but you just gotta keep on pushing. Yeah. Um, so I mean, no, it just I takes our you. ancestors to get us through it, you know? So, so that leads to this question, being in Charleston, I mean, that's where the slave ship died. What, mm -hmm. how does it feel when you go by there, do you hear the voices of the of, of the enslaved people? Do you do you feel that air of whatever was happening during that time? Sometimes when you like close your eyes and you stand in there at the at the at the slave dock, you stand in at the auction sites, what have you. Mm -hmm. well, how, how does that how does that feel? Um, you take. I, I would see it in a few ways. Um, yes, you definitely feel the presence of the ancestors here. 
Absolutely. Um, you also feel the presence of the oppressors here in Charleston. Um, you feel the presence of the enslavers here in Charleston. Um, we uh, we uh, take a look at the papers from last year. The John C. Calhoun statue just came down in June of uh, June 17th of 2020. Um, that statue was up for 120 years. John C. Calhoun owned my family. <laughs> so when oh really? Grip, so you oh, oh really? Yeah, yeah, and I'm still holding the name now. But you know, you got um, you got that type of feeling inside of Charleston to where we are so big on preservation of this old South and this Southern look that when you try to preserve the look of it, you're also trying to preserve that uh, the feeling of the antebellum South, you know. Um, but then also I can look at it this way. I'm sitting inside of the Avery Research Center right now, which was the Avery Normal Institute. And I, if you look behind me, we have the original bricks of the building. I mean, outside of our auditorium right now, and this is the a portion of the building where you can see the most original parts of the building. This building went up in 1868. When you start thinking about who built this building and when this building was being built, it was, um, the brick makers at that time were formerly enslaved Africans that were Af Africans that were inside of Charleston. So when I'm looking at these bricks and I start seeing the fingerprints of those bricks, I know that this building was built for black people by black people. So it's not always a somber thing. We can also turn it and say the ancestors, uh, the ancestors is the reason that I'm here right now, uh, inside of this building doing the things that I'm doing, forwarding justice and forwarding the education of African, uh, of African American history and culture right now because of the fingerprints that are inside of these bricks right now. So we can look at that twofold. Now, I'm personally, I don't do plantation tours. Charleston is big on plantation tours. Person, and also, I don't. I only recommend one plantation tour in Charleston because of their, um, because of their interpretation that they have there. Where look, looking at it from the, from the uh, theme of the enslaved people on that plantation, as opposed to the owners of that plantation. Which one so, is that? Um, Which one is that? Uh, McLeod Plantation as part of the uh, Charleston County uh, system, um, Park System. So McLeod Plantation, they were a part of this big study um, with the National Trust for, Trust for Historic Preservation, looking at engaging descended communities, which we have to do in order to put forth a true interpretation of the history, um, uh, um, especially looking at enslaved. We took that same National Trust uh, rubric and uh, put it towards our interpretation here at our museum. And um, you know that way we can actually look at it from the lens of those who were the grassroots, those of the uh, of the descendants who were enslaved on these places, um, as opposed to the ones who flew in um, metaphorically and said they owned somebody, does, instead of looking at it from the standpoint of the enslavers. Uh, are there uh, celebrations in Charleston from a Black history perspective of some sort? Absolutely, so many of them. <laughs> Okay. So many of them. So um, Charleston has our, uh, I, say, I would say our biggest one would be our remembrance program. And this is a program that goes on and about, that, that happens in about 15 or 20 states and also internationally. Um, the, uh, ours is the Charleston Remembrance Program. And it uh, pays homage to the ancestors who did not make it over to, um, who did not make it over to the states um, um, and um, uh, passed during the Middle Passage. So um, that program happens every June. I want to say it's the second Saturday each June, on uh, the second or third Saturday each June. Um, Charleston's Remembrance Program has been going on for the past 25 years. Um, New York, I, I want to say, has the oldest Remembrance Program up in um, uh, down in Manhattan, um, Harlem, Manhattan area. Uh, I know DC has a long running um, Remembrance Program as well, and they go up and down the coast. Oh so, really? Um, Never heard yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Look at the Remembrance Programs. They're, they're beautiful. Um, over the last two years, they've been virtual, but um, we do our remembrance program here on Sullivan's Island, where um, the uh, the ships initially docked at for quarantine and of the enslaved Africans that were coming in. How, how do you mix you coming from Detroit to running into people down there and they're saying, "Oh man, it's okay, man. I, you know, no big thing," I, because they grew up with it. How, how does that happen for you? Um, I wouldn't say that because one thing I know about the Gullah Geechee people down here in Charleston, they don't take nothing from nobody. <laughs> and, um, you know, they, they've, they've been fighting. And when you look, start looking at the history of resistance of our people, particularly the Gullah Geechee folk, um, they, they never took it. And, and when people think about um, the many forms of resistance from 1739 coming up to the present day, 
um, it, it, they just all manifest themselves in different ways, you know? I so, I mean, and growing up in Detroit, uh, we, yeah, we, we talk fast and we got smart mouths and we gonna, you gonna hear what we got to say. Um, and I took everything that I learned from growing up in Detroit and brought it down here. And also I learned so much from the culture and the Gullah Geechee culture down here that it, I'm, I'm all merged. I'm a Kamiya now. I, I'm a, I started out as a Kamiya, but now I'm a Binya. Um, be it the Gullah Geechee terms of being, uh, being from here or, or um, coming here. You know, so you know, I basically took merged both of my lessons that I've learned throughout my 10 years here and just really with the Gullah Geechee folk. Um, they, when we start looking at Gullah Geechee uh, history and how they were able to retain a lot of that culture from West Africa, from the islands and whatnot, um, do, uh, even though we had forces trying to strip them of that culture. Um, you know, we still got the language down here. You still got the the food culture down here, you still have the religion, you still have the um, uh, cultivation practices with the rice and the crab and, and everything so much um, that this is one of the strongest cultures I've ever been in in my life. And I you see you. that same culture being over in Sierra Leone and everywhere else. Yeah, mm -hmm. now, now, so now you, you're in the, uh, tell us about the place where you work and, and give us some of the historical background about it. Cool. Yeah. So the um, Avery Research Center for African American African American History and Culture as a part of the College of Charleston. Um, we started off as the Avery Normal Institute, uh, a school founded for the education of formerly enslaved blacks in 1865. Um, the building I'm in was founded in the eight, was uh, erected in 1868, like I said before, um, built by black people for black people. Um, now um, we were a private school, and with that being said, we also had to um, uh, with our, within our new interpretation that we have now, we also have to reconcile us being an elitist school because being a private school, you have to pay for it. So um, you, if you couldn't afford to pay for it, and, and, and presumably a lot of the people who built this building were not able to afford to go to the Avery, uh, Avery Normal Institute. So we always had to try to reconcile our history with that being an elitist school. And of course, you would start seeing them, uh, seeing people saying like, okay, we were the school for light-skinned people. It wasn't really true, but you know, you do still, we, and Charleston has a long, uh, long-standing class status, uh, caste status down here. So you did, we did have a lot of light-skinned people that go, went to the Avery. But um, we started off as a normal school. We are a teacher education, we were a teacher education school and we, um, we were uh, in running from 1865 all the way up to 1954. We already know what happened in 1954, you know, Brown versus Board of Education. Um, after Brown and uh, with, uh, after we became a public school in the uh, 1940s and going up to 1954, the city of Charleston felt as if they did not need two black high schools on the peninsula of Charleston. So, so, you, so, you, so, so it was a high school, a grade school, what, what was it? We are a grade school. Uh, initially, we had K-12, through, we had K through 12, um, mainly high school. And then after your uh, last year of high school, you can get your, go on for two years extra to get your teacher certificate. So with the Avery, we, uh, with that teaching certificate, because of the Jim Crow laws inside of Charleston at the time, you cannot teach inside the city of Charleston. So you had to go out to the Sea Islands and go out to these rural areas to teach. And that's what we trained teachers to do, to go out into the rural areas and teach other black folk to go on and um, get, to, uh, get going to higher education. So we were, um, we were well, had a classical, uh, a classical uh, uh, curriculum, but we also had some, uh, some vocational curriculums as well. But, um, that's what that's where it really was uh, really boiled down to. We have a lot of prestigious alumni that went to the Avery. Um, the, uh, one of our biggest alumni being Septima P. Clark, who was the godmother of the civil rights movement. She uh, was really good friends with Dr. King, um, and she started the citizenship schools down here to teach African Americans to be. And what's to her vote. name again? Septima P. Clark. So okay, Septima points out of Clark. Yeah. She's the god godmother of the civil rights movement. She, um, we have her collection here at the Avery now. Um, she graduated in 1916, went on to start the citizenship schools. Um, she uh, was a, a, a regular at the Highlander schools in Tennessee. Um, and she uh, was a really big organizer and uh, activist in uh, uh, training for uh, teaching people citizenship, uh, uh, te teaching people the citizenship test so they okay. can be able to vote. So they empowered them about the vote. She was also an educator. Uh, again, she was a teacher who graduated from the Avery. And as an educator, she was uh, she had a big lawsuit against the uh, Charleston County School District because they once they found out she was working with the um, uh, NAACP, they fired her. 
So she, you know, at September, be, uh, September points at a Clark. Uh, she's like, she's one of our stars that graduated from the Avery and okay. shows how we have this long standing history of social justice and activism that come out that came out of the center. So after we shut down as a school in 54 and they merged all of our students over, over to Burke, they condemned the building to get us out. But then you talk to Avery Ice at that time, and they said they never drew, um, uh, sent a nail on the wall before the Palmetto, uh, the, not the Palmetto, the, um, the uh, secretarial school, who right. uh, the Palmer Secretarial School moved into our building. So okay. about two, three weeks later, they sold our building, even though they condemned it and said that um, it was uninhabitable. They sold the building and then put a secretarial school in it. So they basically yeah, stole yeah, our it's building. It's always some game. Let me, let me ask now, who? Who, who 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 is named after Avery? Is is he a who is Charles Avery? Avery? Charles Avery was a philanthropist out of Philadelphia. So um he's a white guy? Yeah, a white philanthropist. He was part of the American Missionary Association. So we were founded by American missionaries uh out of Philadelphia, uh by the American Missionary Association, the same people who founded uh Fisk, Clark College, um, Atlanta University, uh Talladega College, uh, I got you. just to name a few. Mm -hmm. So now the, uh, the original building was like a one story building, one room. How big was it? The original building? No, our original. Well, this is the original building. We have three floors. We have a, a grand auditorium upstairs where I'm sitting in right now. Um, we had a uh, the, the main floor and I wish I could take you down there, but we yeah, yeah. have some issues right now. But um, uh, our main floor, I would say we had about four or five uh, classrooms. Um, then we also had a, a next door, which is 123 Board Street, which was our teacher. Which, and that's where um, that's where the teachers stayed at. Um, where, that's where the teachers lived at, uh, essentially, um, which also has another long civil rights history to it as well that we're trying to renovate now. Okay, so not so what we can imagine happen is this white guy out of Philadelphia, wherever you you know you said mm -hmm. he decides I'm a I'm a build a school for black for for formerly enslaved students. He, uh, it's not students, had, but formerly enslaved right. people. Right. So, well, the Avery was founded in 1865. So we already we were initially uh, like um, teaching out of a church, but after Charles Avery passed, his estate gave money towards the American Missionary Association. And the American Missionary Association put that money and Charleston to build the school for the permanent school for the Avery, um, what was then called the Saxon School to be called now the Avery Normal Institute. Now, now who, uh, is there, do y'all have records of how many was the first class of students or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have all the records of the Avery. Uh, so we are uh, also an archive and we have all the Avery Normal Institute records. Um, I wanna say our first class, if we are looking at like 18, 66 1867 you'll have about 20 or 30 students there and 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 who are the teachers are they are the teachers white people or, or black people at that the, at first you will have the white missionaries coming down so um that's also my well, field of research i do um uh, i'm a historian and yep. um like i said my my field of research is a, a politics of philanthropy looking at the uh, founders and funders of hbcus and um at that time when you're looking at the ama funded schools they sent the initial. They initially sent their uh, white teachers down to the different schools to be able to uh, to get the school started. But then once they start um, gaining uh, like gaining teachers and training up uh, training up students, then you will have other students coming in back to, um, coming back I to teach. Um, that became a problem in 1916, where uh, the city of Charleston said black teachers and white teachers couldn't stay in the same house anymore. Um, like I said, we had a teachers right next door to where everybody stayed. So the white teachers and the black teachers couldn't stay there. So all the white teachers left um, uh, the Avery. And that's when we had our first entirely black faculty, including the principal. So uh, I would suspect, understandably, that the first classes were learning how to read, write, math, that kind of thing. Yep, yep, yep. We had a classical curriculum. So you're looking at um, arithmetic, you're looking at um, Latin. You're looking at different uh yeah, different languages you're looking at uh yeah, yeah like i said your math your writing your reading um learning all the classics or whatnot yeah, really that's what, we were. what what was there in that in the, let's say in that first class was was there kids that was four and five years old and then there were 30 year old parents who they didn't know how to read and write and they were in the class with the six and seven year olds is that will, kind of that dynamic I wouldn't say what at the Avery. I mean, now we do have we see a lot of that uh, other schools that were um, popping up, especially the Rosenwald schools popping up around the Sea Islands or whatnot. 
Um, but I wouldn't say that, that, that we were a private school. So in order to afford the tuition, you all, it already had to have some sort of standing within the Charleston community to be able to afford you. it. So a lot of the students, a lot of the students that came to the AV were the children of formerly enslaved who, uh, people who bought their freedom 20, 30 years ago, um, um, prior to the Avery founding. Uh, you probably had um, people who were, uh, who were freedmen or who been freedmen their entire lives who went. So um, I wouldn't, I can go back to the records and look, but I don't believe we would have had any uh, that strong. Um, yeah, yeah, that, uh, okay, I got that, you. Yeah. It's kind of crazy. You, you saying something that I, 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 I want to check out a little bit further. So, mm -hmm. okay, y'all was started in 1865, you know, mm -hmm. slavery ended 1865 for all practical purposes. There yeah. was some black folks that had a little wherewithal in 1865 that had a little money that could send Charleston. their kids to that kind of school. Charleston has a long standing caste system, uh, caste, C A S T E. We have a very, very long caste system um, here. Um, we always had freedmen in Charleston. And when people think about uh, slavery and enslavement and whatnot, um, we have to look at a little different being inside the city of Charleston. Um, we had urban slavery and not rural slavery. Uh, and with urban slavery, we had um, a lot of African-Americans had mobility. Um, we had a slave tag system that, uh, that was big down here to where even if you were enslaved, you can move about the city as long as you had your tag on you. Um, Hold on, a tag, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so a slave tag, uh, the official name of it is a slave badge, but at the Avery we say a slave tag because a badge is a symbol of honor and there's nothing honorable about enslaving okay. or slavery or whatnot. So um, when you, uh, your tag will have basically uh, uh, your permit number, your name, your, um, your job title. So say if you were a brick mason or you were a carpenter or say you were a ser okay. uh, servant inside of somebody's house, you can go out throughout the city and make a living. Um, now, and it was a piece of paper or something? No, it was a, a metal badge. A metal and badge. And you wore it around them. your neck? Wore it around your neck. Or, yeah, it had to be visible. Yes, yeah, so you definitely have to wear it around your neck or whatnot. But really? that, with that, um, you also had a lot of enslavers running out there, um, running out there enslaved folk. So if I say, say if um, uh, John Wentworth, who lived down the street or whatnot, had an enslaved people, uh, had an enslaved bricklayer and there was a building being built, he can go rent his, uh, his enslaved person out to that um, job site, make that money off of his enslaved person, that, job, that enslaved person had to bring that money right back. So um, we have this piece of uh, art downstairs called a, uh, a Way Out to where in a very limited instance, you can have somebody who made enough money um, and their, uh, their enslaver toss some money back to them and they were able to save up enough uh, money to buy their own freedom. Right. Now, also in Charleston and in South Carolina, we had things called capitation taxes. And with those capitation taxes, you had to pay taxes on your freedom. So if you could not afford to uh, pay those taxes on your freedom, you'd be right back in slave. Really? So yeah, um, being Never free was a very, being, being free was very expensive. You weren't just free. Um, I mean, but that's when we start looking at um, people like Denmark Vesey. Demar Reese is getting ready to lead, lead a, a slave right. revolt down here in Charleston, but he bought his freedom through the by winning the lottery. And, but he knew that even though he was free, but his family wasn't free, and as right. long as and other black people weren't free, he, nobody was free. So um, you know we have you, you can that shows like the um, the difference of that urban slavery dynamic inside of Charleston to where. You'd be, uh, most people, when they're thinking about slavery, they're thinking about the fields, they're thinking about the yeah, big right. house and the people riding the horses or whatnot. It right. wasn't really like that here in Charleston. And with that, we had a long cast. So we had a lot, uh, a long system of uh, a lot of fr uh, 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 freedmen and walk, walking about and being free within Charleston. So uh, we had some blacks who had a lot of money. You know, um, they they formed their own societies down here. Right. Um, there were right. societies I've that were called. This. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah we. So, there was, so now is the, was the school right? Uh, is the school located like right downtown Charleston, or is it off in the mm, neighborhood or something like that? Yeah, yeah. We're on the peninsula, uh, and if you know the way Charleston looks, the peninsula is downtown. Um, so we are south of Calhoun Street, which is, would have been Boundary Street right now. Um, and also, we got to think uh, the the neighborhoods inside of Charleston didn't really become um, segregated for a very long time. So, you know, you got, we're, we're, we are in right now what people would call a white neighborhood, but 
during the time Avery was built and uh, throughout the latter latter part of the 19th century, this was a mixed neighborhood. So you had uh, black folk, you had people, um, you had uh, black people, you had white folk living all about. But um, yeah, Avery right downtown uh, on the peninsula. Is, that right? Is there a teacher that uh, that taught there for 20, 30 years that's really well noted for being there so long and all the students? Is there somebody like that that you all talk about a lot? Anthea McCartry Smith. Um, she is 90, at today she is 96 or 97 years old. Um, we love Miss Cindy. Uh, she's one of my favorite people in the world. But um, I, back in 2014, we celebrated the 70, 75th anniversary of her first kindergarten class. So she graduated from Avery in 1940, went on to Bennett College and, and graduated from Bennett College and came back to Charleston to teach at the Avery. Oh yeah, man, that's beautiful. Smith, that and and, and so it went all the way up through. Um, you said uh, from from kindergarten to the eighth grade, twelfth, twelfth grade. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of grades. That's a lot of different ages in one yeah. building. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, did, did there uh, was uh, if you don't mind, I ask. I I interviewed a guy from uh, the Piney Wood School. And, and you might find this funny. He tells me, he says, hey, in Pineywood is a boarding school, everybody mm -hmm. down in, in, in Mississippi. Right. And he tells me, he said, one day they caught him kissing a girl and they made him go chop down the tree. You know, that was kind <laughs> of his punishment. Was there, right. was there some in, in unique rules that they had at Avery for the students? Like, did they have to wear uniforms? Did they have to, you know, what time did school start? What time did it end? Did they have lunch? Right. Did they have social programs? That kind of thing. Oh yeah, so um, the Avery, we have a deep history, of, particularly of social programs, um, very, very deep history, uh, going all the way back to the 19th century. Um, depending on what year you're looking at, because you know things change from, from time to yeah, time. We sure. do have records of, we do have records of when school started. We have records of uh, what, uh, what students were in, were in each class. Um, now, again, now our population of students probably wouldn't have a seat of 50 to 75 students because you had to pay for it. You know, Charles are still expensive depending on what you, know, you call it right there. But, um, you know, you, you had, they had their regular class schedule, but then, uh, like I said, the social activity, we had basketball, we had theater, we had uh, cheerleading, we had football, we had, um, we had the high Y club, which would be the YMCA men's club and everything. We had any we had any and all uh, extracurricular activities down here and like i said we hold all those records here, and we're blessed to be able to actually have those records of, of yeah, 1934 we have the class rings we have the uh we have the diplomas from the 19th century we have um uh, different programs or a lot of graduating classes in there um the, the, we have uh, from the graduating classes we have when paul robeson came down here to talk um, yeah. When uh, W.E.B. Du Bois came down here to talk, we have signed books from when Langston Hughes came down here and talked in 1951. So we have all of those records here at the Avery. Uh, actually, okay. very blessed to be able to have those things. Did 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 uh, okay? If y'all got the Avery, like who did? If they had a basketball team, who did they play? The, the regular schools in South in Charleston and maybe in the surrounding areas, surrounding you know, areas, that kind yeah. of thing. Other uh, other high schools, other black high schools. So um, the other the public black high school in um, Charleston well, on the peninsula would be Burke High School. That was founded in 1920. So um, after 1920 and um, Burke came about, we played Burke a lot. Uh, some of the other sea islands where they had schools, we would play them, or even going up to Orangeburg, or coming down, uh, people coming down from Orangeburg. We we played a lot of the other schools. I don't, re I can't recall us actually playing at white school, but we definitely played uh, the other black schools that were around. Laying over in Mount Pleasant, and others. Coming to a close. So now, well, all the principals. Uh, when did the blacks become principals of the school and that kind of 19, thing? Is that the '54 or is that before that? 1916. So, uh, like I said before, because of the Jim Crow laws in Charleston, um, we weren't actually. We got our first black principal in 1916, and because of the Jim Crow laws, they couldn't. Nobody could. They couldn't stay together inside the house anymore. So that's when we got our first all black faculty at the uh, at the Avery. Now our very first black principal would have been when we were founded and that's um, um, uh, Joe Cardozo. Uh, he was uh, actually a state legislator here in South Carolina uh, during reconstruction. So he was our very first black president um, after um, he left to go off to the legislator and, and subsequently being uh, kicked out of the legislature in 1876. 
with the end of Reconstruction. We didn't have another Black president until um, um, Benjamin Cox came in, 19, in 1916. Oh, and so uh, again, so at the at the building, there's these classrooms, there's the auditorium, the gymnasium, but there's also connected uh, a housing for the teachers. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, there's the board. cafeteria. But that would all be within this building. That's um, all. Within, all yeah, but I'm saying they had a cafeteria to serve the lunches and whatnot. Um, was there, uh, did they, they, did they have a prom and, and those kind of dances? Were they allowed to do that and intermingle absolutely. the boys and the girls? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I did an oil history interview back in 2012. I transcribed an oil history interview in 2012, where the Avery would have, um, hosted a, a regular party. I want to say uh, every Thursday or something like that. Now, of course you had, um, particularly during that time you had, um, mistresses and everybody who would watch over everybody, make sure they weren't getting too fresh, as they would say. But, yeah. um, you know, they always have parties, particularly in our auditorium, where they'd go over to Dart Hall, which was the Black Library on the peninsula, and do um, the, the Dart Hall Auditorium and have parties and everything over there. So, yeah, they definitely had parties. They had proms. Uh, we have uh, we have records of the proms and everything like that, too. Uh, you know, uh, you and I might be able to say this because we went to the same high school in the high school it is. Uh, was there jealousy among the other schools about the students who went to Avery or you think you better than me? Is there some story like that or something of that sort? Of course, of course. And I mean, that just came with the, um, that just come, came along with Avery being private. Yeah. You know, you, uh, I, uh, my parents can afford to $2 to send me to the school that I know I'm going to be able to go off to any school that I wanted to. Yeah. Um, then that's, that, that automatically came with the territory yeah, sure. um, where it started to differ, not even start to differ where um, a lot of Avery-ites, what do we call our students, um, made known as that, you know, although they, some of them did not feel as if they were better and some of them actually really took that going forward, but they also went back out into the community to work, you okay, know, going good. out to those sea islands to be able to teach, you know, going out and being part of the anti lynching movement down here, being uh, um, being part of NAACP, being uh, part of the uh, anti-segregation movement inside of Charleston and the civil rights movement within the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s going forward, you know, that's where they had to, um, they they had to get their foundation here in order to go off and do those things. I got but, you. Uh, so none of, nobody was better than anybody, but they yeah, did yeah, have yeah, a great yeah, foundation yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Did the racists try to do anything to Avery? Uh, over the years, did they did they firebomb it at one point? Was it was there ever a riot or something that happened and they tried to destroy Avery because of how good it was? Not particularly. Um, you know, you always had your you know racists who threatened like the teachers who came down. So like the white teachers who came, especially at the beginning, you know, we had um, racists who threatened those white teachers because you know why are you educating these black folk? You know. Um, you also, <clears throat> excuse me, you also had your, um, your, your everyday overt racism going on. Uh, uh, like I said, that castle, you got white man, white woman, poor white man, poor white woman, free black man, free black woman. And then going down from there, be it black, uh, dark skin, light skin going on throughout that entire cast. Um, but they, <clears throat> excuse me, they, um, not necessarily, nobody ever firebombed this building. Um, you, uh, out. I always say some uh, say to the effect that you really didn't have to because we're gonna have a hurricane come through and knock it down anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, one thing about um, that we never been firebombed with, um, with, like in the same vein that they did the first African American Methodist Church uh, uh, AME Church down in Charleston, which would yeah. have been um, where the well, now it's a new iteration. Well, what's the new iteration of Mother Emanuel? So right. um, no, we never had that happen to us particularly. But uh, okay, yeah, you always had your who yeah, I love to it. So now, as we come to close, how do people come? Y'all do tours. What's the website? Right. Let's let we're gonna get people to come down there and check you out. You know, right, what's right, that right. story? So, um, basically, after we were uh, acquired by the College of Charleston, well, do the work of Avery I to save our building because, of course, they tried to turn it to condos. Um, they we finally opened back up in 1990 and became a research center of where we have an archive. Uh, then we also do wear a museum, and then we also do public programming and outreach. So um, we have four pillars inside of our uh, inside of the AV right now. 
um, with, that's part of the original structure of the building, and we use those as our benchmarks of what we do: archives, museum, public education, and community, okay. uh, public programming and edu community education. So um, when you come down to the Avery, when we're open, <laughs> we're not open right now yeah. um, because of uh, some construction as uh, some renovations as well as um, yeah. um, due to COVID. Um, you can come in and get a tour of the uh, original building. We okay. have regular exhibitions that will um, travel in and out. Um, I believe my next show will probably be in February 2022. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we uh, you can come down and get a tour of the building, get learn a history of the Avery Research Center, the Avery Normal yes. Institute, as well as the history of African American and Gullah Geechee people in Charleston. Yes, um, I love it. So, uh, we definitely come down. Our website is avery.cofc.edu. Okay. Um, one of our big fundraising goals right now is to try to uh, raise money to renovate 123 Bull Street to be back the hub of uh, civil rights and so social justice that, that it was once used to be. So um, that's what we're looking at right now. And we, that's um, on the, that's we, all on the website, I'm sure. Right, right, right. Okay. We do our regular programming. Uh, we probably put on like two or three digital programs a month called the Avery Digital Classroom. I love um, it. So yeah, you can always find us on our, you can find our YouTube page uh, under the Avery Research Center. Find us on social it. media on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Okay, I don't know any other person. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Well, hey, is it as we, I guess my last is there a question or something that you wanted to mention that I have not asked you per se? Um, not necessarily. I would. Okay. Um, like I said, I would just want to end off with like the Avery. We have a strong history here. Yeah, we will. We've been here for 150 some odd years. We're gonna be here for another 150 years. Um, we this building has lasted through every hurricane, <laughs> through every earthquake, um, and although we have some renovation problems now, but we we have never not been working at the Avery uh, through okay. the Avery Action, through the Avery Normal and Avery Research Center. So um, I, what I want to get at with that is that uh, you know if you are looking for the history and culture of African Americans inside of South Carolina, inside of Charleston, and throughout the diaspora at uh, large, you got to come to the Avery. We got to come to Avery. Okay. Gotta come to Avery. Well, hey, man, I, uh, I I truly appreciate you uh, coming on the channel and sharing this with us because I, I had heard of the Avery. Um, and uh, I've interviewed a few people on the channel already that talks about the caste system in Charleston mm -hmm. and 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 then, and then white guys just couldn't keep their hands off them sisters, man. They they just right. couldn't stop and 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 mm -hmm. and, and then we're having them babies, and then that was that. Uh, but I, I truly appreciate it uh, that, that that you've come on, everybody. This is what I do with strong inspirations. I find these guys and these ladies and these people who know this history, who are working it every day, who are doing what they can to keep it alive and share this knowledge and educate people, not just the history, but uh, of, of other, you know, programs that you say, uh, learning programs of different sorts, you know, so on and so forth. I, I love that, that Avery is going strong and even at the University of Charleston is, is keeping it and, and helping fund it and, make, and keeping this, this alive. I thank them too and, and, and your know, directors and all them people, <laughs> it's all them folks, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so uh, to you, I say my brother, uh, with all sincerity, man, I want you to stay strong, stay yeah. safe, stay on your grind, man. I love what you're I doing. Say, uh, I say, I say. With that, I say bye-bye. We out.